So this Thursday is Ascension Thursday, and we're at that point in the season where we look from Easter to something new. Looking back, we see Easter as the resurrection event, an event that changed everything. But there's more. There's an event coming that changes everything. For if Christ is resurrected, does he not take his place with all those resurrected before him? But is he not to be resurrected differently somehow? Is he not to be resurrected and glorified, ascended, and given power and dominion? That's what's to happen. And that is the part of the story today that changes everything. I want to just look at these scriptures and the connections of them because I think if we'll take just a few moments to appreciate what they mean and what they bring us, there's something incredibly powerful for our spirituality, our relationship to God, our service to our church and to one another. I love the psalm, first of all, because... You probably know the song that goes with this opening verse. Clap your hands, all you nations, shout unto God with cries of joy. Have you heard that song? All right. So, you know, that's kind of like the music we saw in our presentation of CVS just a minute ago. It makes me want to do the white man shuffle, you know? It makes me want to dance. So we have this praise to God who is, it says in verse 2, High and awesome, the great king over all the earth. And we know kings have power. We know that they have power even of life and death upon the citizenry. They can go to war. They can order us to go to war. They can declare peace. They can cause us to suffer or cause us to prosper. And God is above all of that, greater than all of that. The psalmist puts it this way. He chose our inheritance for us. Now, I don't know what you think your inheritance is, but mine, as uncertain as it may be on earth, is something really glorious when it comes to God's gift and God's reign. When we look at this inheritance and this praise passage, right in the midst of it, right at the very apex of it, is the ascension of God. Now, who is the psalmist talking about? God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Even in this beautiful poetic form, it's almost as if it's the opposite of the second coming that we see prophesied about and read about in Revelation. The Lord is ascending amidst shouts of joy. We don't read about the trump of the archangel here, but we do see this glorious thing happening as the psalmist envisions it. And following it is a surrounding, I want to say cacophony, but that usually implies something negative. There's this wonderful surround of sound, we'll say. Sing praise to God, sing praises to God, sing praises to our king, sing praises. It echoes what is said in Revelation. It echoes the songs of the angels and the hosts. Glory to God in the highest. It echoes those praises. For God is king over all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. He reigns over the nations. He's seated on his throne. The nobles of the nations assemble. The kings of the earth belong to God, for he is greatly exalted. The psalmist has helped us name who God is and that there is none greater The psalmist has helped us see that the ascension of God is surrounded with praise and that there is perhaps, as we look at it from this vantage point, a prophetic word being spoken. The second coming is echoed in reverse and the ascension of Christ is foretold. We get to our Acts passage and something else is going on but not unrelated. Luke is attempting to write systematically what he can of what happened. And he says, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until that day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles chosen. In other words, right up into the ascension, he wrote about it in the book of Luke. 
It says, now, after his sufferings, he presented himself to them and gave them proof that he was alive. Over a period of 40 days, he appeared to them and spoke of the kingdom of God. And one on occasion, while he was even eating with them, he said, wait for the gift my father has promised. The gift that will come to you when you are baptized, not of water, as my cousin John did, but of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is connected to this that changes everything. You see, as long as Jesus was with us, he possessed that spirit. He breathed on his disciples to communicate that spirit. But once he was ready to leave, that spirit would come in a different kind of way. That spirit that was promised. The disciples still wondered foolishly if the kingdom of Israel were going to be restored, but Jesus doesn't really even deign this with a proper answer. He says something that echoes something about the second coming. We read in Matthew. It's not for you to know the times or the dates. Does that sound familiar? No man knows the day or the hour. Jesus is now speaking apocalyptically. He doesn't answer the question about the restoration of Israel in terms of Roman rule, in terms of the lifetime of the apostles asking these questions, in terms of the concerns of the day. Jesus seeks to answer this in a deeper and more spiritual way. Don't worry about the time. Don't worry about the sequence of events. This has been established by the Father who is above all and he's done so by his own authority. Your power will not be in the restoration of Israel. Your power will be in the coming spirit. Let that just sink in for a minute. With the ascension of Jesus comes the promise of a spirit. We'll read in another passage here in just a few minutes that we're clothed in that spirit. That's pretty powerful. He says you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit, dunamis, dynamite, power, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and all Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're kind of the ends of the earth, if you want to know the truth. Although we can find many places far more remote than this was at the time of Christ. After this, verse 9, he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. Now, this is just weirder than weird to me. Sorry. It's anti-gravitation, right? It's just bizarre. People fall from things. They don't ascend from things. And so here Christ is, and all of a sudden, no rocket, no attachments, no special gadgets, anti-gravitation. He's just moving upward. How bizarre would that have been? Okay, I'm the only one who thinks so. (laughs) Maybe you all read a lot more science fiction than I do or something. I don't know, but it just strikes me as a terribly odd sight. But it's a very important one because it's witnessed, just as his resurrection was witnessed. And it becomes the basis in hope that the same way he ascends, he'll return to us again. Don't forget our name. We are Adventists. We're the people who believe Jesus came to be with us in the first advent. We're the people who believe in what he taught, in what he lived, and how he died. We're the people who believe that by the power within him, the life within him in one account, and the call of his father on the other account, Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, as was predicted. We're the people who accept the testimony of 500 eyewitnesses who saw Jesus post-resurrection. We are the people who accept that what he taught them shaped the future of the movement that it began. We're the people who talk about the latter reign and look forward to that latter reign of the Holy Spirit having believed in and understood the the importance and power of Pentecost which is a few weeks off yet. We're the people who accepted Jesus at face value when he said, I will send you a comforter. I will send you a spirit. You will be clothed in power. You will be baptized by this. And so it shouldn't be strange to me or anyone that we would accept that Jesus ascends back to the Father. 
As he's saying this, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you and you'll be my witnesses. He was taken up before their very eyes, according to Luke in the book of Acts. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. When I read this, I thought, reminds me of the movie Men in Black, right? Only these are the men in white. And they show up at very special times. That They're there at the tomb after Jesus has been resurrected. People are looking for Jesus and they're all, what are you doing? He's not here. He's risen. They get the same task at the ascension. People are looking up into the clouds going, where did he go? And the men in white appear and said, what are you doing looking into the sky for? He is not here. He has been taken up to heaven and will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Bizarre, but exciting. Strange, but somehow so perfectly true. Ephesians, Paul takes this whole thing and takes it to a different dimension and level. He's early in his book to the Ephesians and he's speaking in glowing terms and praise. I've not thanked, stopped giving thanks for you and remembering you in my prayers. And I've always asked that the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. There's that gift that's been promised. It's a spirit that will clothe us in power. It's a spirit that will lead us into all truth. It's a spirit of wisdom and a spirit that reveals. It's a spirit of insight and a spirit of revelation. And what is the end of all of that? The end of all of that, according to Ephesians, is that we know him better. Here's a mystical saying. I said mystical. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now remember our psalm. Psalm 47.4, we read, He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. Here he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened and that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. But see, by the time we're dealing with Paul's writing of this in Ephesians, the holy people being referred to are not just the seed of Abraham. They're not just the descendants of Jacob. They're not just Jews. The gospel has been expanded to take in Jew and Gentile alike. Samaritan and Moabite and Jew. It's now global. The mission is now inclusive. And the promise of the Spirit isn't just to the descendants of Jacob. The promise of the Spirit, just as the Savior, is the promise to all people. The glorious inheritance is ours. This gift of Spirit, of revelation. For because Christ was here, and because he ministered and taught and lived and died and was resurrected and ascended, it changes everything. Now he sends his spirit, this promised spirit, this grace, this inheritance. And his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. I have yet to tap into this in any kind of huge way. I pray before I die I might be able somehow to understand this better. I have no power, only the power of gospel, only the power of word as I speak it and teach it and try to live it. But it says his incomparably great power is ours for those of us who believe. The power that is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. This is resurrection power we're talking about. Not just resurrection power, but ascension power. Christ resurrected, that's meaningful but now seated in power at the right hand of God, that's even more meaningful. 
This is universal power. This is greater power than we could ever access in the human realm. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that's invoked, not only in the present age, but the age to come, Paul is covering his bases here. The superlative is being laid down. God, the greatest power, the greatest wisdom, the greatest love, the greatest knowledge, the greatest salvation, the greatest presence, the greatest king that can be known ever in the past, ever in the present, and ever in the future, for all time. Comparable to no one and certainly nothing on earth. And this Christ, who is seated now at his right hand, God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. You are that body. Embedded in you is resurrection power. Embedded in you is ascension life. Embedded in you is the authority of sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Embedded in you are all of these things, the body of Christ, now and for the age to come. Our gospel account instructs us as well. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything that must be fulfilled, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Verse 45. Listen carefully. Then he, Jesus, opened their minds. That's the eyes of their heart. He gave them spiritual vision. You know the text, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. He took the scales off their eyes. He helped them hear. He took the plugs out of their uh, see. He took the plugs out of their ears and helped them to hear. He told them, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You're my witness. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. The image that comes to mind is somebody who's wrapped himself in dynamite, <coughs> clothed in power, not in some sort of sick, self-destructive terrorist sort of way, but an anticipated spirit that dwells with us, teaches us, enlivens us, strengthens us, blesses us, opens our eyes, and helps us see. And the first thing that we get to see is a Christ condescended, a Christ loving lived, a Christ crucified, a Christ resurrected, and a Christ ascended, and finally a Christ coming. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay. He lifted up his hands and blessed them, and while he was blessing them, he left and was taken up to heaven, and they worshipped him with great joy. This is that season in which we have the opportunity to worship our God with great joy. Because what he has done changes everything. And where he sits changes everything. And the power available to you as his body, the bride of Christ, the church, changes everything. You have been gifted with the capacity to change the world. The question is, will you? He has done it all. And now it's our chance to change the world with the message and the power and the spirit that he gives. I want to invite our deacons forward to collect our offering today. I want to remind you 
Your tithes and offerings can go in this envelope in the pew before you. And anything you have for the worthy students we spoke of at Crescenta Valley Adventist School can go in this envelope. Feel free to make your check out to Crescenta Valley Adventist School. They are a nonprofit and will receipt you as needed. Thank you so much.